Good afternoon. Um, so today uh, we'll continue um, on um, the topic of uh, multi-threaded kernels. So in the previous lecture, we talked about uh, providing kernel support for uh, creating and context switching between third, between uh, between threads. Uh, we then uh, talked about user managed threads. And we ended the lecture um, by um, by giving you a roadmap of wh where we want to go. So now that we have support to create threads, now that we have support to context switch between threads, now it's time to provide um, uh, support for synchronization. Um, and in the previous lectures, we saw how you can use mutexes, uh, semaphores, and condition variables to um, uh, for synchronization. Now, in today's lecture, we're going to look at how, how kernel can support those um, those uh, synchronization objects. So we're going to start uh, with implementing mutexes. So that's going to be uh, the first thing we're going to do. Now we'll uh, we'll uh, focus on a single processor system initially. So we're going to be looking at a system with a single core. Um, so the first few implementations that we provide only works uh, for uniprocessor systems, but then we'll talk about uh, multiprocessors and um, and how that could be done. I mean, implementing mutex with multiprocessors. OK, now. So let's start by uh, the simplest and most uh, primitive implementation of mutexes. Now, just as a reminder, a mutex was used to create a uh, mutual exclusion. And mutual exclusion means that when a thread starts executing a, a, the critical section, then no other thread should be able to enter the critical section. So only one thread has the right to execute inside critical section. Now, if you're targeting a uniprocessor, um, what we've seen so far, there are certain events that could lead to a context switch. Now, my argument is if we make sure that no context switch happens when uh, one thread gets into the critical section, then the thread that enters the critical section will exit the critical section um, and would have mutual exclusion because as it's in the critical section, no other thread, we're not going to context switch to any other thread. And if we don't, then by definition, we have provided mutual exclusion. Now you might ask, okay, how do we ensure that no context switch happens? Um, the answer is, let's look at what could cause context switch. And so far, we've th we've talked about the three uh, reasons that context switch could happen. The first uh, is, is uh, basically calling system calls. So when you call system calls, like for example, open or uh, read or write or yield, what happens is you're going to go to the kernel and kernel might decide to context switch to someone else. So if you don't call system calls, then we're going to eliminate this, this first cause. The second cause of um, an event that could cause context switch is exceptions. Now, you might divide by zero in your code. You might uh, access a memory that you're not supposed to, and these could cause exceptions. Now, if your program is written carefully so that it doesn't cause any of those, then we can eliminate this as well. The third cause of, of context switch or an event that could cause context switch is interrupts. When an interrupt happen, happens, we're going to have a 
uh, mode switch to kernel, and then the kernel might decide to context switch. For example, if a timer interrupt goes off, then the kernel scheduler could be um, invoked to make a decision on whether or not we want to context switch. And the way to avoid interrupts is to disable them. So if we disable interrupts, then we're not going to get interrupted. Now, if we put all three of these together, we can talk about our first implementation. So our first implementation relies on the programmer not to call system calls, not to call, uh, not to have any instruction that causes um, a uh, an exception. And then if these two are true and uh, and they hold, then we can just disable interrupts. And now we have created a situation where a thread can start running the critical section and not be preempted. And it goes all the way to the to the to the end of mutual uh, of the uh, the critical section and gets out. And while it's in critical section, no other thread will run again in a single processor. So um, this is going to be our implementation then with with all of that introduction. So class mutex. So we're again, we're kernel right now. We're kernel programmers and we want to design this mutex class that others can use. Now this is going to be our first take on creating mutex. It has two uh, functions lock and unlock. The lock function disables interrupts and the unlock function um, enables interrupts. And this way, if we have the, the if we have the programmer not to call system calls and not to cause uh, exceptions, then this will give us mutual exclusion um, in a unique processor. Now, what are the problems with this? The first, the, the first problem is that we cannot give this mutex to user programs. User programs cannot call mutex.lock. And the reason should be obvious because it's going to disable interrupts and disabling interrupts cannot be executed in user mode. Users are not able to, to do this because if they were, they could put something like this that you, you can see, mutex lock and then while true, and that's it. The system gets stuck and nobody can interrupt this anymore. So you have to do just you know manually shut, shut down the system or restart your system. So we cannot give this to the users. So that's the first problem. Uh, the second problem this has is it's not going to work on um, multiprocessors. Uh, and the reason is when you disable interrupts on one CPU, the other CPUs still could be interrupted. So you're not going to disable interrupts on all CPUs. And you know one thread is running at, inside the critical section, the other thread could also get inside the critical section because they could be scheduled on other on other CPUs. So it's not going to work in any system other than a uniprocessor. And finally, it's going to be really bad to have this design in mission critical systems, right? Because one of the ways that in a mission critical system, your system interacts with the environment is through the interrupts. So, you know, let's say you're putting this in a in a um, uh, in a uh, satellite or in a nuclear uh, facility and let's say something wrong happens and an interrupt is raised but because one program or one thread is in its critical section you never get to see this interrupt and that could be disastrous so okay that was our first take let's uh, look at take two let's make this design a little bit more interesting um, and let's focus on, uh, let me go up. Let's focus on um, this, the first, as the, 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 this last aspect. Uh, let's address this one first, which is, you know, 
if I have a programmer that does this um, mutex dot lock, um, and then it enters critical section. And this critical section is really long until it ends and it calls mutex.unlock. So let's say this is going to take like two minutes. Now, if I go with the first take, I'm going to be disabling interrupts for two minutes. And that's really bad because a lot of things could happen in this two minutes and my system wouldn't be responsive at all during these two minutes, right? So let's see if we can still use uh, disabling interrupts to create critical section and to create mutual exclusion, but without allowing the interrupts to be disabled for two minutes. Let's see if we can make this a lot shorter. Now, the idea to do this is to create internal variables for our mutex and then use disabling and enabling interrupts to manipulate those variables. So now we're not going to enable interrupts and disable interrupts for the entire critical section of our programmer. We're going to enable interrupts and disable interrupts every time we want to, you know, make changes to the internal state of our our mutex. This should remind you of the readers writers lock, where we have internal, where we had internal variables inside our reader writer lock, and we use the mutex to um, create mutual exclusion for our program to change those internal states. We're going to do the same thing here. So. We're going to add additional variables and then use in enabling and in disabling interrupts to create mutual exclusion whenever we want to change those variables. So how do how do we do that? So I'm going to add private uh, elements to this class. In particular, it's I'm going to add a value that is initially free. And I'm going to add a queue. Uh, so this is going to be the queue of tasks or threads that are waiting for this for this um, mutex to be unlocked. So if somebody calls lock and the lock has been already, uh, if somebody calls lock on this mutex and the mutex is already locked by another thread, we'll put this color uh, in this waiting list. And eventually, once we go through all the all the threads waiting, eventually this thread will wake up uh, to have the have the mutex locked. So these are the two private elements I'm adding, and and then I have the public elements, which 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 are the two operations on this mutex: lock and unlock. Again, I want to remind everyone of the lock we were writing for the readers writers uh, problem. And there we had four operations, you know, uh, acquire the lock as a reader, release the lock as a reader, acquire the lock as writer, and release the lock as writer. Now this is similar. Here we have two. These are the two operations on the mutex. Um, and then these are the internal states. And now we're going to use disabling and enabling interrupts to change these internal variables. OK, let's look at it without further ado. Um, this is my lock function. At the beginning of it, I'm going to disable interrupts. I'm going to check the value. Uh, if it is busy, it means that somebody has locked it. So I'm going to put myself to sleep. So I'm, I will add myself to the waiting list. Uh, I change my state to waiting. And, and then I uh, choose another uh, thread to run. And Finally, I call this thread switch that we saw in the previous lecture. I switch to another thread. So I was running right at this point in the middle of this function, a context switch happens. So we context switch to someone else. And we are doing this because I cannot continue, right? I wanted to, to lock the mutex, but I figured out that this mutex has been locked before. So there is nothing for me to be done at this point. I have to wait 
So I put to sleep myself and uh, I find somebody else and I context switch to them. So, so this is going to end here. Now, at some point, we're hoping that when the mutex is released, or when the mutex uh, is unlocked, I will wake up and get it eventually. Or if somebody else is waiting before me or whatever scheduling policy is put in place in waking up uh, threads, eventually I wake up, right? Eventually I'm going to be context switched to. And at that point, I'm assuming that I will have the lock. So when I start running again after this line, I'm going to be assuming that now I have the lock. So somebody has unlocked the mutex and gave it to me. So I'm now going to wake up. So I'm back. So when we re return from this function, it means that we're back. We have somebody has context switched to us. So then we change the state to running um, and we get out. So otherwise, if the value was not busy, then it means that the lock was free, so I can lock it. Sorry, the mutex was free, so I can lock it and change the value to busy and done. Um, then I enable interrupts. Remember, uh, we disabled interrupts. Now we enable interrupts uh, and we get out. Now let's look at uh, unlock. It's similar. So when you want to unlock, you probably want to see if anybody is waiting, right? So you disable the interrupts because you're going to change the state of this lock. Uh, you, ch you check if somebody is waiting. If they are waiting, then you remove them from the waiting. You change their state to ready, right? Th their state was waiting. Now you change it to ready. And to just let you know, they they were running, they made it to waiting. Here we make it to ready. Eventually when they run, they become running, right? So anyhow, here you make it ready. You add them to the ready list uh, and that's it. Otherwise, if nobody is waiting, then just change the value to free and in this enable interrupts and get out. Now I want to note here something important. Um, note here that inside this if, I did not change the value to free. And inside this if, I did not change the value to busy. And this is, but this is obviously um, for, you know, uh, better performance because I could potentially, you know, here make the value uh, ready and then when this guy wakes up, he can get it. Um, but I prefer not to do that because uh, if I do that, then there is there would be some, you know, uh, some corner cases where, you know, somebody else could come and unlock the mutex. Um, and then, you know, there would be problems. So instead, I don't change the value so the lock rem the mutex remains locked and when this guy wakes up that i kind of like you know gave it the the go they will be the one who holds the lock and eventually when they finish they could make it free or give it to someone else so it's kind of like if somebody is there you just wake them up without releasing the lock uh, and when they start running they are the one holding the lock and eventually the last person after everybody is uh, done will just release the lock. OK, so somebody is asking, but now we have two methods that are reading, writing to the ready list. Does that cause any issues when running in separate threads? No, right? So this is not going to happen because we are we are still considering a uni processor. And we are disabling interrupts and enabling interrupts at the beginning and end of these, right? So while we're manipulating the ready list, while we're manipulating the value, interrupts are disabled. So we have mutual exclusion. No two threads can access uh, the, the value or the queue because we're disabling interrupts. <clears throat> 
Okay. One note to make here is. If you remember, we talked about um, reordering of instructions. You uh, disabling and intra enabling interrupts are memory barriers, usually in most systems uh, in x86, for example, or in ARM. Uh, so when you enable and disable interrupts, these act as memory barriers. What does that mean? It means that any code that comes before uh, disabling interrupts, if you have any code here, they cannot come after this. And any code you have after uh, disabling interrupt cannot be reordered on top. So this is provided to you by the hardware. It, it acts as a memory barrier. It makes sure that all the instructions on top of this uh, disabled interrupt are going to be executed first. There could they could you know be reordered. That's fine, but none of them can be reordered by none of these instructions after the disabled interrupts. And then none of these guys can be um, reordered with anything that comes after enabling interrupts. So these guys act as memory barriers. So anything in 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 between is going to happen in between and anything before is going to happen before and anything after is going to happen after. Within those areas, you could have reordering, but across these three areas, you cannot have reordering. OK, um, now let's discuss this. Uh, this. Um, um, implementation. Um, the this implementation. Actually addresses the issue we had with. If you remember the two minute um, example I had that you we had this thread that would be in its critical section for two minutes. And we didn't want the enabling and disabling interrupts, uh, the interrupts to be disabled for two minutes. With this implementation, now we have that, right? Because we are just enabling and in disabling interrupts for these few instructions to check the value and add threads to the queue. And after that, we enable interrupts, right? So, the interrupts are going to be disabled only for the critical section of the mutex, not the critical section of the programmer. Let's say the programmer wanted to use this mutex for its database. Now we're not going to disable and enable interrupts for the entire critical section of that application. We're only disabling and enabling interrupts for our critical section, which is changing the value or adding or removing uh, threads from the queue. So only the few instructions that we have, if I go back to this figure, only for these instructions, which is short, right? These are short. Uh, both of these two functions are short. So the enable the interrupts are enabled and disabled only for these instructions, which is plus. So, you know, no matter how long the critical section of the programmer is, we're not going to disable and enable interrupts for them. So it's going to be for few instructions. So for few cycles, we were disabling interrupts and then we are going to enable them back and we're still getting uh, critical section and mutual exclusion implemented. So that's good. So we have addressed that one. Um, right. Um, one question you might ask is, um, wait a second. You told us that a thread is going to disable interrupts and then put itself to sleep, basically get suspended. Now, this enable interrupts executes later on when this guy wakes up. So I'm going to disable interrupts and then this enabling interrupts is not going to happen immediately. It's going to happen later on when, when I wake up. So what, when, when am I going to enable interrupts? Now let's let's address that question. How is that going going to work? Let's see if we can enable interrupts here. Can can I enable interrupts here? Um, the answer is no. You can't, because if you enable interrupts, the next line you're going to access this shared variable. 
which is your waiting list. And you're not going to have mutual exclusion. So that's bad. So you can't do that. What about here? What if I disable enable interrupts right before I call this thread switch? Can I do that? And the answer is no. This is also not a good idea. Why? So here is a scenario which, which could happen. So let's say you enable interrupts. But before you execute this thread switch, an interrupt happens. And because you enable the interrupts, right? Right after you enable interrupts, timer goes off and operating system context switches to another thread. Let's say that other thread is the thread that holds the lock. Like it's the it's the thread that has locked the mutex. And now it wants to release the mutex. So what, what does that, that thread do? So the thread looks at the waiting list and finds that you are there. So it says, oh, this there is another thread there because you put yourself there before you enable the interrupts. So you're in that list. So then the one that wants to release the lock says, OK, I'm going to give you the lock now. So they put you on the ready list. Right, they change your state. You change your state to waiting. They're going to change your state to ready. Uh, and then they terminate and later on you're going to run because now you're on the ready list. What are you going to do? The first thing you're going to do is to call this thread switch. Right, because you got interrupted here. Now the first thing you're going to do is context switch. Well, why are you context switching? You shouldn't be context switching. You should be running, right? So you, you're going to put yourself back to sleep. You're going to suspend yourself. And this is a mistake. This should not happen. So, so this is also a bad idea. I can't, I can't uh, enable interrupts there. So then you might ask, okay, what the heck am I going to do if I can't enable interrupts? Uh, and the answer is, well, you should enable interrupts atomically when you context switch. And you might ask, how is that going to happen? Um, the answer is, we can put in place a convention that that the kernel programmer should abide by. And this convention is, any thread that starts running, any thread from anywhere, whenever you context switch to a thread, and that thread starts running, they should enable interrupts. The first thing that they do. Now, if we do that, then I can put myself to sleep safely and context switch to someone else, knowing that that someone else is going to enable interrupts on my behalf. So this is how it's going to work. Let's let's look at this example, thread A, thread B. Thread A is going to disable interrupts and call thread switch. Then we're going to context switch to thread B. Thread B will probably start running from thread switch. And so it returns from context from thread switch. And the first thing it does is enabling interrupts. And let's look at this. It's actually what we have in the code. If you look at the code, we go up. And let me clean this mess I created. Oh, what did I do? Um, so look, you wake up here, right? What do you do? The first thing you do is you enable interrupts, right? So we already have this convention implemented for locks at least, for mutexes at least. And this this has to be implemented everywhere because a thread could wake up not just in uh, in the lock anywhere, right? So any function that we write that has this thread switch, so any function, any kernel function that has this thread switch, needs to enable interrupts right after it returns from that function, right? So this becomes a convention that if we have then we, we should be okay. So somebody can disable interrupts, call thread switch, 
Now this thread switch will wake up in another thread who previously called thread switch, and that thread is going to enable interrupts, the first thing it does. So we're, so we're going to address this problem by just putting, putting in place a, a, um, a convention that we're going to abide by. So, so basically that's what we're going to have. So eventually this guy, for example, is going to disable interrupts and call thread switch, and then we will wake up, and right after we wake up, we enable interrupts. So all is good. OK, now what are the problems? So we addressed one problem, but let's look at other problems that this implementation still has. So first of all, we still cannot give this to user programmers, right? Because we're still um, using enabling and disabling interrupts, and that's not cool, right? A, a user program cannot, cannot do that, cannot um, enable or disable interrupts. So this mutex cannot be used by user programs, user libraries. Uh, the other problem with this is that it, again, doesn't work on multiprocessors because disabling and enabling interrupts only works on the same processor, not across multiple processes, uh, processors, uh, excuse me. So it's not going to work. Now, you might ask, okay, what should we do then? Um, and the answer is we need hardware support for this. So uh, if we want to create mutual exclusion, um, in a good and you know uh, effective way, like always, for efficiency, we need hardware support. And the alternative that we're going to look at is called atomic read modify write instructions. So so far, if you remember from from the lecture on concurrency and synchronization, I mentioned that as you know, in, in the lectures, we're going to assume that loads and stores are atomic. What that means is if you have a load um, into some uh, load in, um, in a register from, from an address in memory, it's going to be atomic. It's not going to you know, load a um, few bytes, few bits, and then get interrupted and then do and load the rest of it again. It's going to load the entire thing at once atomically. Or if you're going to store something in memory, it's going to be atomic. Um, so these are the ones that so far we have been assuming and we, we have been using. And just to remind you, I said that in x86, that's generally true for words, which is like eight byte, uh, eight bit um, addresses uh, or variables. So if you have a variable like a character that has eight bits, that is generally true. Now, if you have variables like integer or floating point that are more than a single word, then that might not be true. Uh, in x86 uh, specifically, it's only true if the address of that variable in memory is a multiple of its size. So if the size of the variable is eight bytes, then the address should be a multiple of eight for the load and store to be uh, atomic. So that was a just just a reminder. Um, now, now we want other instructions other than load and store that could happen atomically. Um, and these instructions, so let me give you three examples of them. So the first one is test and set. So one thing to just clarify here is that I'm looking, we're looking at the functionality of test and set. I'm describing here what test and set instruction does. So this is the functionality. Now we are asking hardware to implement this functionality for us in an atomic way, meaning that when this instruction executes, I want all three of these um, operations 
to happen atomically. I shouldn't get interrupted in the middle of this execution. I want all three of them to happen or none of them to happen. I don't want two of them, for example, happen and then I get interrupted or I don't want one of them to happen and then I get interrupted. I want the three, for example, in this case to happen without me being interrupted. And now I'm telling you that hardware is going to take care of it. So we're not going to worry about how this is implemented in the hardware. We're going to just assume that hardware is giving us this functionality. So there is there is load and a store that are atomic, but also there is a test and set that is atomic. So what does it do? So test and set gets an address in memory. It loads that address. So this is why we have read, modify, write. So first it reads that address. Then it modifies it. And and writes it back. So this is modify and write. So I'm writing in my memory in that address. I'm writing one. So I don't care what was in that address. I don't care what it was. I'm going to just write one in that address. But then I have already read that address, so I'm going to return whatever it was there. So in essence, I'm going to go to memory look at that address, whatever it was, I'm going to return it, but I'm also going to ch change it to one or maybe I don't change it. If, it, if it's already one, it, it remains one. If it was zero or anything else, it becomes one. So that's test and set. And again, all of this is going to happen atomically. I'm not going to be interrupted in the middle of it. The second um, example of read, modify, write is called swap. So this one, gets uh, an address and it gets a register. Uh, and what it does is it goes and reads the address from memory. Uh, so puts that in a in a temporary uh, location, then changes that memory address to whatever I have in the register. So compare that to this test and set. This test and set always sets the that address to one regardless of what it was in it. It always sets it into one. This one swap sets it to whatever you have in that register that you're giving it. So it sets that memory address to to whatever you want it. And then it uh, changes the register to what it was uh, in the memory. So that's the swap. So I, I'm basically swapping whatever was in the register and whatever was in the memory. I put whatever it was in the memory to the register and I put whatever it was in the register to the memory. So I swap them and again, all of it atomically. So here is the functionality. It doesn't mean that it, this is exactly how hardware does it. It just tells you this is what's happening. So this is the functionality hardware implementation. We don't care. We're just trusting the hardware to give this to us atomically. The last one, which is a little bit more um, complicated, uh, so has more functionality, is compare and swap. So with the, with the swap, we we don't compare them; we just swap them. Uh, with compare and swap, we can put a condition. We can say if a certain condition holds, then swap. Otherwise, don't swap. So this is how it it, it works. So we check the memory with register one. So this, this function gets uh, or this operation has three inputs, the uh, a memory reg memory location and two registers. So we we first compare the memory and the first register. And if they are equal. Then we swap the memory and register two. And we return success. I, I guess we don't swap. We just write register two to memory and return success. Uh, and if not, if the memory is uh, holding a, a different value than register one, then we return failure. OK, so these are three examples. There are more, so th this is not where it ends. There are other complicated uh, atomic read, modify, write uh, instructions, and this is usually 
architecture dependent. So different architectures have different instructions. Now, for the rest of this lecture, I'm going to just use this test and set. Um, usually in the exam, I ask a students to implement whatever we're going to implement with swap or compare and swap or other atomic operations. So um, you can, we can now use these as tools to implement mutex. And we're going to see how to use this one in particular to, to implement mutexes. But you should be able to get that concept and you know, implement it with swap or compare and swap or any other uh, uh, instruction that enables you to do so. Uh, there are examples of this um, in uh, on the website. So if you go to the section on resources and you look at those uh, um, sample exams, you can see a bunch of them there. Uh, it frequently, uh, it's a very frequent question that is asked in operating system co courses. But before you go there, I recommend that you think about it yourself, right? Give it a shot, see if you can do it yourself. So if you can implement a mutex using swap instead of test and set and see if you can do that. Um, but anyhow, so let, let's move on. Now, we're, I'm going to use test and set to implement a, uh, a, 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 a spin lock. So I'm not going to Im use this directly to implement mutex first. I'm going to use it to create a spin lock. And once I have the spin lock, I'm going to use a spin lock to create mutex. OK, so with that, let's let's get into it and you will see why it's called the spin lock. So here is a simple example. So he is simple implementation. Um, my spin lock has a value. The lock function is going to be simply while test and set that value. And the unlock function is going to just make that value to zero. Now, why is this going to work? The reason this is going to work is this test and set is going to set the value to one. So when the value is one, we're going to assume that the, the mutex is locked or the sorry in here, the spin lock is locked. And when the value is zero, the spin lock is unlocked and it's free. So that's why in unlock I'm setting it to zero. But in the lock, I'm using test and set to make it one. Now, why am I not just doing, why am I not just reading and then writing one to it? Because if I have a read and then write, the read is atomic, the write is atomic, but both of them together is, are not atomic. That's why I needed this test and set to read and write in an atomic way. So this is basically what happens here. I'm reading the value and then setting it to one. Now the value when it, the value when it returns, it's either zero or one. So either the the value was zero, which then test and set returns zero, or it was one, in which case test and set returns one. Now if it was zero, this means that the spin lock was free, so I can go. I don't need to wait. So this while fails because it, the test and set returns zero. So no waiting is required. I can go. So now I locked it, atomically made it one and returned zero. So I can now continue. If however, this the value was one, after I execute test and set, nothing changes. I'm going to just write one on a value that was one and return one. So this while is continuing. So that's where the spin lock comes because we're going to spin here. Uh, as long as this value is one, we're going to just execute this in a loop and keep writing one to this memory. And you might say, OK, this is absolutely not uh, efficient. You're spin locking and you're correct. So if I use this as spin lock and give this to my programmer, so if my programmer says, Spin lock, um, sorry, spin, um, spin lock dot 
uh, lock and then critical section blah 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 and then spin lock dot unlock and let's say this is another one of those two minute um, uh, critical sections now what happens is the first thread goes in, right? So no spinning is required. The value was zero, so it makes the value one and it goes inside. Now, if this thread is interrupted and another thread runs, then the second thread will come here. What happens? Now, this the value has become one and it's going to just a spin lock here for as long as it will until it gets interrupted let's say the timer goes off and we context switch to someone else or if you have a multiprocessor now this solution we can actually use it in multiprocessors right because um because test and set works for uniprocessor for works for multiprocessor similar to load and store load and store also are atomic in multiprocessors so test and set is also good for multiprocessors. So let's say thread one executes. Now it's inside the critical section. And at the at this time, thread two comes and tries to lock the spin lock. Now it can't do it because thread one has already done it. So while thread one is running in this two minute critical section, what is going to happen to thread two? Thread two is going to spin lock, just waste CPU time for two minutes, not doing anything, just you know, test and set, test and set, test and set, test and set for two minutes un until eventually thread one uh, sets the value to zero by calling unlock. And at that point, then thread one starts, thread two uh, starts running, goes inside the critical section. So we are basically spin spinning on uh, test and set and wasting CPU time. So this solution gives us mutual exclusion, but it's very inefficient and it's very wasteful in terms of CPU time because we're actually using the CPU, but we're using the CPU for nonsense. We're just using the CPU to run this while loop. So that is a good segue to how we're going to use this now to fix this, uh, the mutex problem that we had by, um, okay, so I, I guess I, I uh, talked about all of this. Okay, now uh, there was one point probably I have to mention. Okay, um, what is priority in, in, in inversion? So um, in ECE350, I have a slide talking about priority inversion. And priority inversion is very important in real time systems. And the course in ECE350 is called Real Time Operating System. So, because I don't have any slides for you, because we don't have time to talk about real time systems, so just ignore this point. It does not appear to in your exams or anything. So, we're going to just Pretend that this was not in my slides, so uh, so that's that. Um, in semaphores and monitors, threads may wait for arbitrary long time. Right. So 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 this is basically the 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 effect of having this busy waiting, and it's it's highly. Uh, um, you know, undesirable to do this busy waiting. So, what should we do? We're going to use this as spin lock, which is very inefficient, to create mutex that is efficient. How? So, the idea is uh, so somebody is asking, should we be passing the address, not the value? Um, that's a good point. I thought, yeah, it, it, this requires a, 
a um, yeah, it has to be uh, the address of value. Sorry. Yeah, this is a this is this is a um, um, no. Actually, no, 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 no. It's a call by reference. So the one that I'm that that I have here is called by reference. So no, you just put the value and it will be called by reference. So a reference to this value will be passed. Okay. It shouldn't be address. It's it's called by reference. Okay, um, going, continuing. Um, so the idea is, let's use this uh, this uh, spin lock the same way we were using in, in enabling and disabling interrupts to change the internal state of our mutex. So I'm going to add now, I'm going to have three elements in my mutex. I'm going to have the value, which is initialized to three. I'm going to have this spin lock now, which I will be using to create um, to create mutual exclusion whenever I'm changing the state of my mutex. And I have this waiting queue. Uh, and continuing to have uh, two operations, lock and unlock. Now, this is the first time I'm going to bring the a scheduler class here because I'm going to need it. You will see why I need this uh, class, but I'm just looking at the components of the scheduler that I need for my mutex um, and leave the, the uh, portions of the scheduler that I don't need uh, out. So. In particular, I'm going to need the scheduler to have this ready list. So this is basically the ready list of the, the operating system. This is where we're going to put every ready uh, thread. Um, I'm going to introduce this a spin lock for the scheduler because this ready queue, this ready list is a shared object, right? Let's assume that we have a multiprocessor. Um, and different threads want, sorry, different um, different uh, interrupt handlers might run on different cores when they get interrupted. Let's say timer interrupt goes off on core one, timer interrupt goes off on uh, CPU two, and both of them want to uh, schedule the next thread. Now, if both of them are going to look at the ready list and pick one, then the ready list becomes the shared data that is accessed from two different processors. So I kind of want mutual exclusion, otherwise I will mess up stuff. So this is where I'm going to use this uh, a scheduler spin lock to create mutual exclusion for the scheduler. Um, and I'm going to use these two functions from my scheduler. Again, the class of scheduler could be much larger than this, might have much more, uh, many other elements and functions and stuff, but these are the minimums that I need for my mutex. That's why the, the ones that I'm showing you. Um, and we're going to just use these two functions, suspend and make ready. So the suspend is the function that is going to eventually call thread switch. So it's going to suspend this thread and then switch to someone else. And make ready is a function that is going to change this thread to ready. That's that's all it does. OK, so with that, let's look at how we can implement lock and unlock. Uh, let's focus on lock. The first thing I'm going to do, I will use the mutex, the, sorry, the spin lock to create cre um, uh, mutual exclusion. Then I will check the value. If the value is busy, I put myself to the waiting and then I call the scheduler suspend. And look what I'm uh, passing. I will pass uh, this a spin lock to the scheduler. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want the scheduler to put me to sleep and release this a spin lock. Because if I go to sleep while I, the, this a spin lock is locked, then nobody else can do anything with this mutex because I'm I have locked the the, the spin lock 
and now I'm suspended. So nobody can look at the internal state of the mutex and that's bad. So we have to release this and go to sleep. Now, where can we release it? Can we release it here? Can we release it here? Now, the story is the same as story that we looked at with enabling interrupts. So if you enable interrupts here, it's going to be bad because you're going to use this waiting list. If you enable it here before you go to sleep, the same thing could happen that you you uh, before you actually go to sleep, somebody could release the lock and then you go to sleep after receiving the lock, which is not desirable. So uh, we're going to give it to the scheduler and make and trust the scheduler to put us to sleep and release them this spin lock in in an atomic way so we'll look at the code for suspend so it's going to happen inside the in, inside the suspend now at this point we're going to be suspended so we're going to be done and we're going to go to sleep um, eventually somebody will release the lock uh, and unlock the mutex so we're going to start running from after this suspend so what uh, so we're going to just return and assume that we have the lock sorry we have locked the mutex uh, and if the value was not busy then we just make it busy and we unlock the the spin lock now let's look at unlock uh, it's going to be very similar to what we saw uh, in in the take to uh, implementation. So just check the waiting list. If there is anybody, then ask the scheduler to make them ready. Uh, and otherwise, free the value and unlock the mutex. Sorry, unlock the spin lock. OK, now some serious discussions. These are very important and quiz worthy. Um, can I use this mutex inside my interrupt handler? Let's say, you know, my interrupt handler is going to access some memory uh, to write or read, and this memory is shared with some other kernel threads. Um, and I sort of want mutual exclusion for this memory. I don't want two different uh, codes to run. Now, can I use this mutex in my uh, interrupt handler? Can I have this inside my interrupt handler, say mutex.lock? And the answer is absolutely not. We cannot do that. Why? Because interrupt handler is not a thread. Interrupt handler is not a schedulable. We don't want to suspend interrupt handler and then schedule it some other time. That's absolutely not something that we want to do In, because interrupt handlers are not schedulable. These are just functions that have to run, have to uh, run right after an interrupt happens. So if we use this lock, we're going to suspend, we're going to call the scheduler to suspend this. And that's absolutely not what we want. So no, this is not going to happen because interrupt handlers are not threads, are not schedulable. So that's a no-no. Um, so you might ask, okay, how on earth can I then do this, right? How can I, if, if I need mutual exclusion, between my interrupt handler and my kernel threads, how can I do it? And the answer is you can actually use the spin lock. So a spin lock had, uh, had the, the implementation that we saw, there was no suspension, right? All it had was a spinning, uh, so it was still running. So there was no scheduling going on. There was no suspension. So you could potentially use them, but, but, be careful because you might end up in a deadlock situation. How? Let's say you have a uni processor and one of your threads, uh, which might have some uh, critical section with, uh, with an interrupt handler, locks the mutex, sorry, locks this spin lock to access that data. 
and then for some reason interrupts happen and the interrupt handler starts running. Now interrupt handler starts running. It's going to call spin lock the lock and it's going to just wait for this lock to, for this spin lock to be released. Now we have now deadlock. Why? Because the thread holds the mute uh, the spin lock. So let's put this is the thread. This is the interrupt handler. This is the this is the spin lock. Now this spin lock is hold by the thread. Um, and now the thread is waiting for this interrupt handler to finish, but then the interrupt handler wants this a spin lock. So, so now we have we have deadlock because every like the the spin lock is held by the thread, and the thread is now interrupted or preempted by the interrupt handler. So, if you wish, we can put the CPU here as another resource. So the thread is now waiting for CPU. But the CPU is held by the interrupt handler, who is now waiting for this spin lock. So this is an example where our resources are spin lock and the CPU. Thread one, the thread is holding the spin lock and waiting for CPU to run. And the interrupt handler holds the CPU because we're running it, uh, but wants the spin lock. And now we have deadlock. So in order to avoid this situation, if you want to use the spin lock in your threads that are shared by uh, that have critical section with the interrupt handler, make sure to disable interrupts to completely avoid this situation. We can just in disable interrupts, then lock the mutex, lock the spin lock, and go do whatever you want, and then unlock the uh, spin lock, enable interrupts, and you're safe. Because you didn't let the the interrupt handler to to come in and get the CPU from you. Okay, these are really important, guys. Make sure that you understand them completely. Um, now let's look at uh, the uh, scheduler functions. So the the first one is suspend. Um, how do we do it? So the suspend, we're now talking about the scheduler, right? And the scheduler had this a scheduler a spin lock. Now a scheduler a spin lock is a spin lock that might be used by the interrupt handler. Let's say, you know, the timer interrupt handler might also want to schedule another thread. So might want to lock the spin lock, the scheduler spin lock. So I have, this is exactly the situation I was talking in the previous slide, where I have this uh, spin lock that might be used by the interrupt handler. So I'm going to use what I said we should be doing in the previous slide, which is disabling interrupts. We don't want us to get interrupted to avoid deadlock. So then I lock the spin lock, the scheduler spin lock, and this is different from this spin lock that was passed to us. So the spin lock that was passed to us, we unlock it. This is the spin lock that the, the, the thread passed to us to release on, on their behalf. So here is we are unlocking it. Uh, then we change the state of that thread to waiting, uh, and we add it to the ready list. Then we context switch to someone else. Um, and once we come back, we change the state to running, we unlock this, the spin lock, we enable the interrupts, and that's it. The, and the ready queue is very similar. So enabling, disabling interrupts, locking the spin lock, adding the task to the thread to the ready list, making the changing the state, um, unlocking the spin lock and then enabling interrupts. Uh, so these two basically talk. Th this uh, these points are why do we need this disable interrupts, which I explained. Okay. Um, so let's put everything together. 
so I'm just showing you two implementations that we have seen so far. The implementation with disabling interrupts and the, the implementation with spin lock, they're very, very similar, right? So it's kind of like we're just using this a spin lock to uh, cre create mutual exclusion the same way that we were using enabling and disabling interrupts. Oh, somebody is asking, I'm kind of confused about the difference between a scheduler spin lock and a spin lock. Right, so if you, if you remember when I was uh, in the um, declaration of our class mutex, yep, here, let me again uh, remove everything. Um, mm -hmm. So as you can see, the the mutex has had its its a spin lock, and the scheduler had had its own spin lock, right? So this is spin lock we're going to use whenever we want to uh, modify the state of the scheduler. This is spin lock we're going to use every time we want to modify the state of the mutex. So these are two different uh, spin locks. OK. Um, so here is just a recap of everything we said. So this is the critical section of our, pro uh, our programmers. These are the, this is how we want this mutex to be used. We want to lock the mutex. Uh, go to the critical section and un unlock it. This is from the programmer's point of view. And here is how we we implemented it first. Just simply disable interrupt and enable interrupt. Then we said why this is bad. Because then all the way inside this, the, the, in, in, the interrupts are going to be disabled and that's bad. So then we came up with this better implementation where we disabled interrupts and then changed the state of the mutex and then we enabled interrupts. And this was good in terms of, you know, not making interrupts disabled in the entire critical section of the program, but it still was bad because it was just for uni processors and it wasn't, we weren't able to use this for a user, pros, a user programs. Um, then we came up with this, um, other implementation with test and set. Again, we started with this simple, simple implementation, just using a spin lock um, as, as opposed to mutex. So this works, but again, the problem with this is busy waiting. So the thread that is waiting is going to be busy waiting. And it might busy wait for a long period of time, which is bad because it's just wasting CPU cycle. So then we kind of implemented this better implementation where we use the spin lock to modify the, the state of the mutex. And instead of busy waiting while we're waiting for the, for the mutex, we put that thread to sleep. And then later on, once the, the mutex is free, we wake up that thread. So we're just busy waiting for a short period of time. So we're busy waiting only for this internal uh, few instructions to execute. So that's better, right? We're not going to busy wait for the entire critical section of the programmer. We're going to only busy wait for few um, instructions. So in essence, busy waiting is almost um, unavoidable. We have to busy wait. So then the question is, do I want to busy wait for a long time like this one? Uh, sorry, like this one, this implementation. Or do I want to busy wait like just a short amount of time and suspend myself and then get, get back to running when uh, when I can? OK, so um, the last thing I want to talk about uh, or no, actually not the last thing. I have 11 more minutes, so hopefully I get to talk more. Than this. Um, how how are mutexes implemented in in Linux? Um, so there is this observation that has been made by studying different programs that concluded that mutexes are usually or most of the times 
mutexes are free. Like 90% of the time, the mutex is free. So when you call mutex.lock, it's, it's free. You can lock it and get out. And 10% of the time, like 5% of the time, I don't know, a very uh, um, a fraction of time, it's locked uh, and then you have to be suspended. So Linux takes advantage of this information that locks are free most of the time. So it designs a fast path for the case where the mutex is free. So if it is free, it designs a really fast path to lock it and continue. And if it is not free, then it switches to everything that we have talked about. So all the implementation that we have talked about. So how does it work? So this the the in Linux, um, other than this uh, the the spin lock is there and the waiting queue is there but instead of having this value that was zero or one they have this counter um now if this counter is one this means that the mutex is free if it is anything less than one then it means that the the, the mutex is not free so this is a um uh, notation in x86 that you you define this counter to be atomic. This basically means that I you know I want to load and store to this to be done atomically. Um, now here is the fast path. Um, if so, this one lock uh, decrement. This guy atomically decrements counter. This is another test and set, sorry, uh, load, modify, save uh, instruction in x86. As I said, there are many of them. So this is another one. What it does, it decrements the value and returns the, the original value, right, atomically. So this way, I can decrement this counter and then check if the, the released value was one, it means that the lock was free. So I just decremented it in one instruction. I locked the mutex and now I can jump to the critical section. So if not zero, if not, if not um, uh, zero, then I'm going to jump to the critical section. So this is the fast path. And this is going to happen most of the time. Most of the time, this is not going to be uh, locked, and I can just lock it in three instructions, right? This instruction, uh, oh, sorry, two instructions, and then this instruction, and then just jump here, and I'm done. So I took care of the fast path, which is 90% of the time, 95% of the time. I'm going to just execute two instructions instead of all the instructions that we had uh, previously uh, in, in essence like calling the spin lock dot lock and then checking the value and all of that we for forego that um, and if not if this counter comes to be not one if it is zero or negative then we go to this uh, a slow path the slow path is basically all the implementation that we have seen so far so we basically call then we call the mutex.lock function that we have implemented uh, and we go through the slow path. OK, so somebody's asking, Haim, I'm currently about 15 minutes behind, so can you ignore this if you already um, talked about it? But on the slide for mutex with spin lock in shouldn't the mutex unlock the spin lock outside of the if else shouldn't the mutex unlock the spin lock i think uh, you're asking about um if i'm not mistaken you're asking about why is this inside the else uh if i'm not mistaken right so we don't need it. We don't need it outside. Um, 
uh, because um, because it's already done for us. So here, um, when we wake up, let me go back. So uh, you you can you can I I don't want to spend time on this, but you can go and look at the implementation and see that when you get out of this if the the mutex and spin lock is already unlocked for you so you don't need to unlock it okay okay so we talked about that um um mutex implementation discussion so <laughs> First of all, why are we still talking about mutex? Because uh, we have to. Um, but um, one last detail that I have to note is that everything that we have talked so far were about kernel threads uh, calling these functions. So, so far this lock and unlock, I treated them as function calls, right? So we were just implementing this functions inside the class mutex. Now, if you want to have them as system calls, then you have to be careful because with system calls comes all sorts of, you know, other stuff with enabling and disabling interrupts. If you remember when, uh, you know, if you're in user space and you call a system call, you're going to disable interrupts and jump to the interrupt hand uh, jump to the system call handler so because in in the implementations that we talked about there was in enabling and disabling interrupts you have to coordinate this with your system call handler so there there has to be some more work to be done so it's not just simply putting these functions as system calls and be done with it there has to be some other considerations about about how you implement uh, your system, but the idea should be the same. So you can still use the ideas that you learned here uh, in having, you know, spin logs and having um, internal state for your mutex and modifying them. Okay. Um, okay. Next. Uh, so we talked about mutex. Uh, next stuff is semaphore. Uh, and semaphore is very easy, so I can just look at it in one slide. Uh, the, the implementation of semaphore is very similar to the implementation of mutex. So I'm going to have this, the value, I'm going to have um, the semaphore spin lock, and this value is going to be initiated to whatever the programmer initiates the semaphore to. But when you call P, you're going to check if it is zero, then you're going to suspend. Otherwise, you're going to just decrement the value. Uh, and with we, you're going to do check if anybody is waiting. If they're waiting, you make them ready. Otherwise, you increment the value. Now, again, note that similar to mutex where we didn't free the mutex here and we didn't lock the mutex here i'm not doing value uh, plus plus here and i'm not doing value minus minus here inside these two ifs uh, because of the way i'm implementing it so even though in in when you describe the functionality of v v is supposed to do value plus plus but in this implementation, I'm canceling them out because it's kind of like this guy, the, the one that calls V, if somebody is waiting, will wake that up. And here I don't increment so that that guy that wakes up doesn't decrement, doesn't need to decrement. So I kind of cancel them out. It's very similar to the mutex where instead of making the lock busy in, in the one that wakes up someone and then making it, sorry, making it free in the one that wakes up someone and then making it locked or busy in the one that wakes up, we just cancel them out. So this is an implementation. It doesn't have anything to do with the functionality. We just cancel them out in for our implementation. Now, can you use um, semaphores 
inside your interrupt handlers? Uh, the answer is you cannot use P because P has this suspend function. So you shouldn't use P in your interrupt handler, but you definitely can use V because V doesn't suspend anything, right? V basically just uh, makes someone ready. So it doesn't suspend the interrupt handler. So we should avoid suspending the interrupt handler because it's not schedulable. Um, so you cannot use P, but you can use V. And if you remember the discussions that we had about you know, the comparison between um, condition variables and semaphores, and I, if you remember, I said condition variables, we can't use them inside interrupt handler because they need a mutex to be locked and we don't want to do that. Now we know why. Um, and then I said, instead you can use semaphores and this is where, where, where we can see why and how. So you can use this V function inside your interrupt handler to send signals to threads that are waiting for something, right? And that easily can be done. Okay, so I stop here. The, uh, hopefully next in the next lecture I go through monitors really quick because we're almost done. Uh, so monitors are all also very simple to implement um, and then we can move on to uh, to talking about schedulers. Okay, thank you for sticking around and attending the lecture. Uh, thank you for those of you who are watching it um, uh, afterwards in, in the recordings. So take care, be safe, uh, talk to you next week. Bye-bye.